Hey, how's everybody doing? Welcome to day 250. Can you believe it? 250 days. We've got, what, 100, 115 episodes left. Can we do it? I think together we can. I'm Tomlin's back. This is 365 days towards racial change. Pleasure to have you with, with us. Welcome to the new subscribers. Um, I'm not an authority on the subject. I'll introduce you to the guy who is, but we'll, uh, first of all, I'll put in my two cents as we go. I'm just regurgitating uh, some historical factual information. Um, my motivation is that uh, this has this uh, realization that the information came to my life such an opportune time. Um, bumping up against all kinds of resistances and issues in America's system towards me. I've now kind of boiled it down to it's an issue with my race or more specifically my color. Someday i got to get back to reminding us that black people cannot be racist. And it's impossible and that, that's a whole other argument we could spend plenty of time on that down the road. Hopefully I'll get back to that. Oh, but I am concerned about black thinking in America. You know, I feel like, you know, it's the, the, the level of passivity, acceptance of what blacks do, who blacks are in America is, is profound and disturbing at the same time on a lot of levels. And we really got to get down to always being aware of of the attack, the the resistance arrayed against black people in this country. It's insidious, uh, covert. It's not as overt as as maybe uh, 50, 60 years ago. But it, it is very real and shows up at uh, incredible time. I was just, right before this episode, I was just thinking about something out of the Bible. I fear not, we're not trying to proselytize here on racial change. But the, the portion where, where Paul the Apostle says, you know, be, be on guard. Your enemy uh, is prowling about, uh, just paraphrasing like a roaring lion you know, waiting, waiting to devour you. And, um, that the, the enemy of racism uh, can, can take shots at you. I mean, I was just recently, I was at work, probably in my finally, in my most serene moment, and I was met, although I was meditating on some some heavy issues all night at work and, and the this, this supervisor just cut into that and oh man just I just exploded out of meltdown because you know? <laughs> I wasn't on guard for the enemy black mind has to be on guard always thinking alert aware, not checking out, um, not being, not having the mind clouded with substances, um, uh, with, with different ideas, uh, materialism and things like that, but, but sober always because this thing is, is constantly at us, the black mind. White folks need to have, you know, get to check themselves, I think, as well. You know, this privilege that they have, this cloud of favor on them. You know, you got you to gotta hand it to them. They found the nation, exploited everything to put it in their favor, and positioned themselves to um, <laughs> to be in control. Well, 
I mean, yeah. I don't know. The problem comes in is that they've written laws and documents that says the equal opportunity and there's uh, the, you know, equal access and competition and stuff. We just want to hold their feet to the fire on those issues, you know. Um, but racism is not that simple, is it? You know, so, so you know, for the white mind, you know, at least recognize that you live and that you're immersed, embedded uh, in this space that, that favors you and that there, there are whole groups of people at a disadvantage, marginalized, um, who are well aware um, of your position, even if you're not. Although I would say many uh, white people understand their, you know, how how fortunate it is to be born on that side. That's one of the issues that come that came up in Uncle Tom's cabin before we took this break. Was you found it's conversation, and, and that was written by a white woman. You find this conversation uh, periodically finding um, the voice that says, wow, you know, glad I was born white, you know, so we don't have to suffer like them, inherit that, um, that truth of being um, coerced and manipulated and and dehumanized in the land. Find that in Dr. Uh, no, I'm sorry, in uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's work. So, you know, white mind. You know, at least, you know, in her work, she, you know, it's a fictional work, but she's being honest about it. You know, we'll, when we get to the end, we're going to learn s some more stuff about that. Financial literacy, check your money, understand how your money works, but uh, you know, put away for the future, on and on. You know, uh, expect to live to be 150 and you need your money to be working for you and not have people manipulating you and stuff. Had I uh, calculate, put a longevity into my calculation of life, uh, I would have appreciated where my money was going and you know, so much opportunities squandered. But I'm aware now and at least I've stopped digging the whole start doing something, find out, understand, do something now about your uh, financial literacy, your financial position in America, especially black people. Oh, I'm inspired by a man named Dr. Claude Anderson. Uh, he's written uh, a lot of great works. We're uh, going through a lot of his books here. Um, I think tomorrow will be the last day of our focus conversation in his work and we'll get back to Uncle Tom's cabin. But if you can only get one of his books, get that one, <clears throat> A Black History Reader. And uh, it'll open your eyes to this race dynamic in America. We also look at black labor, white wealth, search for power and economic justice, and Dr. Anderson's national plan to empower black America, power dynamics. Yeah, you can find Dr. Anderson at powernomics.com. Behind me, you see the hashtag us too simple. You'll find black women there conversing, supporting one another, and uh, developing their community around their issues. Check out Black Enough, B L H U G E N U F, kind of black Facebook experience. If you can't find your flavor here on the World Wide Web, do what I did start your own community. Got a handful of flowers, a private email list. Yeah, it's just what I need right now. Nothing over the top with a million followers and stuff like that. I, I'm, not, I'm really just not into that. Really. Anyway, and finally, like I said, we have story time. Uncle Tom's cabin. A very important time hanging out. And. getting our, our feet into um, 
what's going on in America, black lives, and all that. You know, and having a lot of discussion points on that. Today's part two of uh, community versus neighborhood as far as black folks go. Oh, anyway. Yesterday, we talked about uh, blacks having a community, the differences uh, between communities and neighborhoods, neighborhoods just where people live, but the resources aren't staying there. So Dr. Anderson says the black neighborhood is like a bucket with holes in it. Uh, but a black community would be a closed, focused group, you know, ethnic aggregation, black folks working together, vertical integration, uh, where black folks are in control of all aspects of a production or service. You know, and that would be, uh, be a closed loop circuit within the black community. It would be a great, thriving community. But instead, we, we talked about uh, how other groups, Asians, whites, Arabs, I've seen, um, you know, other groups extracting resources from the community and not replacing, not uh, encouraging, um, helping infrastructure growth of the neighborhood, but just extracting, extracting, taking, and taking uh, from the neighborhood, uh, you know, and, and not putting anything back. And, and those business owners, alcohol, bodegas, uh, laundromats, things like that, you know, extract, take, you know, but they go home, they drive to their, uh, you know, out the suburbs somewhere, trees, quiet, and all that, and, you know, uh, live lives uh, so foreign to uh, the black experience in the places where they have their store or business or whatever. You know, or even like, you know, a black community located near an industrial complex, you know, that kind of thing. You know, the, the true black community uh, would have the resources to keep that space clean and not be uh, uh, in danger or at risk from uh, negative effects from industrial America in that sense. Uh, Flint, Michigan is something that comes to mind. <clears throat> Before the 50s, you know, the 50s, blacks had numerous communities. Uh, we talked about uh, Tulsa, comes up a lot, Rosewood, I thought that just comes up off the top of my head. Um, but we can talk about Harlem, Watts, Sweet Auburn, Atlanta, and uh, Georgia, there were places where, you know, blacks did have communities, uh, did organize, congregate, have group loyalty and stuff like that. So, so many of these communities were sacked uh, uh, for, for minor reasons, you know, uh, some rumor that a black man had, has uh, approached a white woman and that's enough to get a uh, whole white communities. <laughs> Um, an uproar, and then go in, burn, sack, pillage, and lynch indiscriminately, uh, reducing the community uh, to ashes and rubble. Um, and those communities never recover again. Uh, talk a little, talk a little bit today. Uh, Jim Crow. Now, Jim Crow uh, actually had it was. I don't know, two edged sword, you know, it was kind of a mixed blessing in that it forced blacks to circle their wagons, so to speak. You know, that the white establishment had closed its doors, wasn't interacting or helping uh, facilitate black growth, progress, competitiveness, then uh, the blacks response to Jim Crow, well, they just circled their ways. They had their, created their own communities, and, and that was, that was fine, uh, as long as the blacks were being sacked and all that stuff, yeah, it worked out quite well. 
excuse me again. Um, so the so segregation and things like that made the black community uh, blossom and bloom. Um, there were ten times more black businesses, you know, in that response than there were today, you know? and it would they had to. White establishment wasn't allowing black folks to interact. Therefore, what you know, you, you gather, do the next right thing. Of course, um, you know, you don't rise up, revolt, try to be violent. You simply say, okay, we're going to do our own thing. You know, and it's it's sad that in the, in, the, in in light of the success. Uh, Rosewood, Tulsa, Watts, Sweet Auburn, Atlanta, Georgia, places like that, you know, that there was this uh, overwhelming white backlash against that, that uh, reduced those communities, those thriving communities to rubble. Um, now, the other side of that, um, that mixed blessing of Jim Crow segregation was that, you know, um, strong black leadership was diffused, diluted uh, across the, the American landscape. You know, that, that these communities were closed, smaller, and, and whatnot. Um, uh, they, did, they didn't have uh, you know that that controlled uh, uh, controlled energy effort of um, the, that a larger contiguous connected same white community or other communities enjoyed. You know, there, there are pockets here, and a pocket there, and this here and that there, which made which was another reason that made them easy targets to be sacked. Uh, in the first place, Tulsa, Rosewood, places like that. Um, so there was no um, no overall control of uh, uniform control of the culture, which is which is again that's a uh, you know after effect of of the conditioning of white society, anyway was to um, was to have that dynamic in place you know um, it's it's just that this disunity and stuff we, we've talked about some of the Meritorious manumission and, and some of those things, uh, tearing up families and stuff, were a part of making um, keeping blacks uh, in disunity anyway. You know, so it's no surprise you had a pocket of black community here, 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 and not like a good strong national network. And that's the same challenge that black folks are having today, you know, which is why blacks. You have neighborhoods, these buckets with holes in them, instead of a community put together in one controlled, closed unit. <clears throat> um, immigrants uh, know the power of the unity. Uh, we talked yesterday, you know, what would it be like to see immigrants, well, they wouldn't be immigrants, but see people enslaved over hundreds of years and then see if they could bounce back and be come back unified and stuff. We'll, we'll never know um, unless things get real bad. <laughs> um, but the, the immigrants are free people coming, so it's easier for them to find each other. Um, uh, you know, they, they keep, they, they come, they embrace one another. Uh, so they, they have some some social infrastructure in place that makes them successful in the land. Uh, blacks, 
native blacks don't have that but because of conditioning and slavery and stuff like that. So we'll, we'll give them We'll give him some points on that. Now, Dr. Anderson, he, he uses uh, the Vietnamese as kind of a test case for um, for what he's trying to promote. Now, granted, remember, the Vietnamese are coming as free people. Uh, blacks did not have that opportunity. But uh, we could still glean some, uh, some lessons from the Vietnamese experience, you know. So they came, uh, they came, now the government like initially scattered these people all over the land, you know, so that they did not unify and, and uh, congregate, you know, but uh, the Vietnamese still had such a national loyalty, identity, and whatnot that they naturally came together, gravitated toward one another, and made their communities prosper and rise. You know, they had the group loyalty, group code of conduct, uh, you know, some of those five points we talked about yesterday. Uh, you can look at uh, yesterday's um, description and you see that towards the end, those five points. Uh, tougher for blacks, you know, to, to do this, you know, we're, we're <laughs> Dr. Anderson's encouraging us to do this uh, from a different perspective, from a different angle. And, uh, you know, we need to appreciate the conditioning and stuff that, that I just talked about. Um, another thing that's eroding black efforts, you know, um, as contrasted with the Vietnamese experience is integration and civil rights. You know, there's no other group fighting for integration and civil rights in the way that, that you know, black people allow, that black people you know, fall, in, fall into this integration and civil rights argument. You know, no other group does that. You know, um, any group using that language, they don't use it to 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 participate with whites as whites. You know, they use that language to to participate in their own identity competitively in the American system, but blacks. Uh, well, we want to charge and we want to be as white folks and with white folks and stuff like that. It's, it's a very different dynamic there. You, know, you, don't, you don't find um, Vietnamese integrating and civil writing and stuff like that. You know, they <coughs> glean and focus uh, civil rights integration rhetoric to support their group and their group moves as a unit in a specific direction. <clears throat> but they're not dispersing and disappearing within the white landscape by any means. You don't see the Arabs integrating and civil rights and the way black folks do. You find them being cohesive <clears throat> you moving as one group with a common goal in America's landscape. <clears throat> LGBTQ, you don't find them integrating and, and civil rights um, in the same way blacks do in America. You, you see them um, you know, collecting and focusing their energy as their group, you know, the rainbow and all that, and living from that space uh, in a very affirmative way, you know, not, not integrating civil rights with in the white community. They maintain their identity. They're very overt. They have a lot of pride in that, and that's how they move forward. 
but blacks are the other way. We 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 die then socially. We civil right into the white, and then and we, we disappear into that uh, into that space. Try to disappear in there, uh, camouflage yourself, come, try to come incognito in there. Um, but, but that's a mistake. Right? Um, you don't see the Hispanics um, integrating civil writing into a white culture like that. You, know? you see the Hispanics maintain their language, uh, cultural um, indicators that, 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 that show that they're an exclusive community, and that's that's perfectly fine here in America. It's only blacks that shy away from being uh, exclusive, affirming themselves collectively, generally, you know, <clears throat> in America. Um, in all of this, in this community, versus neighborhood argument. You know, it seems, it still seems as though no matter where blacks place themselves, try to uh, put themselves in the argument, uh, they're still locked at the bottom of America's economic structure. Um, you know, even though we navigated so, so some hellacious times in history, domestic terrorism and the like, and all that, you know, I, I'm of the mind that we, we should not be shying away and being timid about being an exclusive group. I don't, I don't, I don't say we have to be overtly parading it everywhere. You know, we don't, uh, you don't see a whole lot of groups with that. Although we need a, we, we could use a parade and a, a holiday, and some real uh, genuine stuff, not a diluted month of stuff and all that. One birthday uh, that that's a, that did not that does not gather gleam what uh, black American people need in America. But but those things would be nice. Uh, Consistent parade, consistent celebration, holiday, and stuff like that. But you know, I, you know, as I move around in America, uh, I know I've been discriminated against by certain groups, whether they do it uh, consciously or unconsciously. I don't know, but I know it has happened because of my color, and it's they, there's, they don't wave a big batter and sign say we discriminated against you because you're a black guy we don't want you part of this you know said so we have the power to exclude you we just keep it secret you know I know that has happened you, can, you know you can't tell me that has not happened to me in America I know it has so that that kind of thing so but you know the conversation is you know, black people need to get a community going uh, we really need to have <sighs> get specific okay, and have some say in, in what goes on in America and to become competitive and we need to do that through creating and developing strong viable communities in the land. Thanks for hanging out with me for day 250. I'm Tom Lins Nyback. Please join me again tomorrow. Let's see what uh, we can get into. Bye-bye.